we've just installed our very first SALT battery. That's right, sodium ion technology. It's being talked about more and more today as potentially the future of battery storage technology. So in this video, we're gonna dive deep into the full install, including with solar PV panels and backup power. And at the end of the video, we're gonna tell you three reasons why we think that sodium ion technology might be the future of battery storage. So this is the Eleven Energy Sodium Battery. Eleven Energy are a new company out of Cambridge, which we're local to, and they very kindly sponsored today's video to give us the opportunity to showcase this product fully for our audience. So the batteries go in this, and it looks like a cool box, but it's not. It's a battery enclosure, it's IP65 rated, because the batteries are modular, they're rack mountable essentially. So rather than mounting them inside in a normal sort of server style rack, we're mounting them outside in this IP rated enclosure. You can fit two modules in each box and we've got four battery modules to go in. So we've got two of these boxes and then they'll just DC couple together and connect into the hybrid inverter. Now you may have noticed there's a slight problem with this roof, moss. The roof is absolutely covered in it. And if we were to just lay solar panels over the top of this moss, you can imagine the chaos that might ensue with damp, then when the panels get hot, the moss heats up. It could even be a fire hazard, to be honest. So the first thing we need to do before we can start laying any panels is get rid of all of this moss. So what they've got to do here is scrape all the moss off with this scraping tool, clean it all up nice, and then they're gonna spray a biocide on it that's gonna mean that the moss doesn't grow back. And that's key because obviously there's a lot of moss spores or whatever you would call them on this roof right now. We don't want the moss just growing back under the panels and all over the panels. So the idea is to do the hard work now to make sure that the system's good for the lifetime. I got loads of room. Oh, they've got white lines on, that's annoying. I don't know if they're what I ordered. I think they should be all black. These are, yeah, these, these are no good. So the delivery driver has dropped the panels off at the end of the driveway to the little estate where we're working, right in front of somebody's door because he couldn't get them down the driveway. We just opened them up and found that they're the wrong panels. They're supposed to be all black panels and these have got white lines on them. So they're gonna have to go back. But if you can find out and let us know, that'd be great, yeah. We don't, we don't like no white stripes. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> right, okay, I'll, I'll find out, thanks. So this is the salt battery from Eleven Energy and it is literally what it says on the tin, it's made of sodium. So it's a sodium ion battery instead of a lithium ion battery and lithium and sodium are very close to each other in the periodic table, so they have very similar properties, but salt is everywhere. We've got loads of it, so it's easy to source responsibly. It's also really easy to recycle, which makes these a very, very sustainable battery, but it's also got some other interesting properties as well, which we'll talk about later in the video. Now, obviously, because we're mounting these outside, we're using the cool box solution, but actually inside, you don't even need a rack to mount these in. These little brackets go on the sides and they basically act as the feet. And then you can just stack them one on top of the other, which is quite nice. Obviously, you, you're gonna need to put them somewhere safe if you are installing them inside. And with the PAS 63100 regulations, even though these are super safe batteries, those regulations are pretty blanket to say, don't install batteries inside a living space. But it could be inside a garage, for example, could be perfect or some kind of outbuilding. So a really easy solution to mount it either inside or outside. No, it's not. Oh, there we go, that's it. Now these batteries have technically 100% depth of discharge. Now they say it's 95% with these, because you should always leave a 5% margin of safety, but actually with sodium batteries, you can drain them completely without them dying, which is another advantage over lithium ion batteries, for example. So the roof's all clean now. The biocide has been sprayed on to stop the moss growing back. And the guys have already got the deck tight flashings and the DC cables in. We're just waiting for the replacement panels to arrive and the hooks, and then we can get all the hooks and rail on and start getting panels on the roof. Beautiful. Is it Ico or Aiko? 
Aiko. Yeah, Aiko, 480 watt panels, all black, they look super sleek. So on this project, we're installing on a plain tile, otherwise known as a rosemary tile. So for these specific tiles, we have something called a hook stop. Essentially what this is doing is replacing a tile below the bracket, and then when the solar system and installers are on the rails, it's gonna take the, the weight, because if this wasn't there, um, the tile's likely to crack, so that just takes away that. We use two, some installers might only use one, um, but we just kind of want to take the risk out fully. So a lot of guys maybe would just put this one, but we decide to put this one as well. So when the hook comes over, the hook tends to sit about there, but we just don't want anything going onto this tile below either. So if you see here now, this has got a lot of pressure on that. So if you imagine, if this was just a tile like that, it's gonna snap as soon as we put a panel on there, or even when we install a hook. But now that's, you can put on weight on that, and this one, they're both protected. On the Hookstop website, it actually shows with the picture of the Hookstop showing up. But when I install it like that, I notice that it kicks the bottom up of the thing like that, which I don't like. So I actually install them like that. So if anyone knows the correct way, and or maybe why there's a reason why it kicks up, uh, let me know, because I'd be really interested to know. Now, on this project, as part of this install, we've replaced the consumer unit. We did an EICR first, and then we've upgraded the consumer unit. Now, the old one was not too bad, but it just didn't have enough spare ways for future expansion. And what we've done as part of this is we've installed two main switches in the consumer unit, one for the backup side, which is fed from the EPS terminals and the inverter. That gives certain circuits backup power in the event of a power outage and then the rest of the circuits in their house are off a separate main switch. The customer asked us to future-proof this install, so we've wired it in big enough cable that we can upgrade the inverter to a 12 kilowatt inverter in future, which means that he'll be able to have more circuits on the backup side. But for the moment, all of his essential circuits will stay on if there is a power cut. Right, so we've finished installing all of the 20 panels now. The next job is to install the solar skirt. So everyone's not a stranger to this. It's a premium bird blocker. Essentially what you do is you go around, clamp all of these clamps to the panels and then essentially it just slides in um, and it looks super smart. It kind of brings everything to a whole. It makes the whole system look all one to the roof. So it's beautiful stuff. We're finally getting there on this project. It has taken a little bit longer than we expected, mainly due to issues with materials not getting delivered right. But we're doing a few little finishing touches on the panels. We've got to get the Tygo taps connected up, get the final connections done on the battery system, and then we can commission it. The panel install team yesterday did really well getting everything on and all neat, but they didn't have what they needed to connect the Tygo tap, which is like the sort of communicator beamer thing that talks to all of the Tygos. Uh, Tygo access point stands for it's basically like a Wi-Fi access point for the Tygo systems and then they all talk to that. There's one on this side of the roof and one on the other side of the roof. We've just got to get to that and finally wire that up and then get these panels back on. So this is the Tygo access point. So on this system every panel's got an optimizer under it and this is the brain that connects to those optimizers. All I know is it works really well, particularly in systems like this where you do have quite a lot of shading, uh, multiple roof facets and things like that. It's a way to get more bang for your buck. So we were just figuring out which cable was which over there because we've got two cables there. One comes across to this roof and the other one goes down to the main device. And we've used this continuity tester to bell them out so we know which one's which. Okay, so because of our limited space here, as you can see, we've got a pipe on this side and a gut on this side. Everything basically fits in here perfectly. But all we've got to do is get these battery cables up. So obviously the only way through, the only way to get them to the inverter, because they're pre-made lengths, um, we're gonna to have to go through this. So luckily we've got a DC surge protection device here. And there's loads of room in that. So basically what we're gonna do is, because these are DC cables, we're gonna take them through the DC surge and then pop out the other side of the trunk in. Okay, so I'm just taking off these lugs. Um, we actually put these on, these are 35 mil lugs because of this cable. Um, initially we thought we were gonna to have to extend the cable um, and then re-crimp re it basically. But because of the way we've done it now, the cables that are pre-made and are sent with the kit basically, they have plenty of uh, length now, so we can just turn them out straight into the battery. So we're placing our panels on the Tygo app, scanning all the serial numbers so that we map everything out. 
and then the Tygo system will ramp up and start to give us power. This is how the panels are laid out. So we've got 10 panels on this east facing side, two on the south side and, f uh, and eight on the west. Tuck that in there. So now it's time to start testing and commissioning. So first we're gonna do the DC tests on our solar PV strings just to make sure everything's reading as it should and generating as it should before we liven things up. Sometimes you can get issues with like polarity and things like that. So we just wanna check that first, make sure that's all good. Then we're gonna power up the batteries and go through and commission the inverter. You get an irradiance reading from, really you need to be on the panel. So maybe Luke, if you can go up and hold it like that on the panel, the light sensor is there. Yeah. And then tell me what the reading is. Well, it's this front one is 181.5. Okay, so how it works is you've got voltage, so you open circuit voltage, which is what we're testing now. Then you've got short circuit current, and we'll measure that by plugging the positive and negative together and putting the clamp meter on it. And then you've got your irradiance reading, which is watts per meter squared. And those three combined enable us to see whether the solar PV system is performing as designed or whether there's something not quite right. So we've identified our strings. So this is string one, you can see it's got one cable tie and then the same for string two, red positive, white negative. What we do is we plug our solar PV tester in like this and we get our voltage reading. Feels a bit weird, right? We're plugging the positive and negative in together, but then actually you can put a clamp meter around it and then you get a short circuit current reading. Because the irradiance is so low, that's to be expected. Usually the voltage will stay about the same, but the current will be lower when there's less sun and higher when there's more sun. So we've got a total of 20 480 watt ACO all black solar panels here. These are the new Gen 3s, it's our first time using them, so it's been interesting to see how we get on. First impressions are good. And that total capacity then for this system is 9.6 kilowatt peak. We've got eight panels on this roof, which is west facing, and you might have noticed there's a huge amount of shading here from the trees. So we've tried to compensate for that by installing Tygo optimizers on all of the panels to get the most out of it but we have explained to the customer that realistically this roof is only gonna generate a decent amount of solar for a few months of the year, but he was happy to make the use of this roof space anyway. Over on the end here, we've got two panels on the south facing part of the roof, and then we've got 10 panels on the east facing part of the roof, which is the part that's gonna generate the most energy. Those panels are gonna get a decent amount of sunlight throughout the day, especially in the morning. Now you'll notice that these panels are actually too close to the edge of the roof. Normally the MCS guidelines say that we should have a border of about 400 mil all the way around the roof. So in order to do this acceptably, we've had to do extra wind loading calculations because the reason that the panels shouldn't normally be this close to the edge of the roof is with uplift from the wind. But actually, in this area, there's barely any wind because we're surrounded by trees, we're surrounded by other properties. So when we did the wind loading calculations, it was absolutely fine, but it is a little bit of an exception that we don't usually make. In this case, it was necessary just to be able to actually fit two rows of panels in portrait on this roof. The other thing that's a little bit unusual about this roof is it's quite steep. It's about 43 degree pitch. Normally the ideal is around the 30 to 40 mark, say 35. Um, but in this case, actually the steeper pitch is quite good uh, because uh, we get a nice angle for the sun. So ignore the flashing lights at the moment, the commissioning is underway. But this is the North Sea EL6000 inverter from 11 Energy. This is the brain that does all of the AC to DC stuff and it is a hybrid inverter, which means that we plug the DC from the battery straight into it, as well as the two MPPTs of solar PV. Then below this, we've got all of the usual stuff for safety purposes. We've got the AC isolators, one for the mains in and one for the EPS which is basically the backup power out of the inverter. We've got a couple of DC surge protection devices to protect our strings, and then our two DC isolators. And then below, we've got the main event, which is these batteries. They're enclosed in these IP65 containers. Uh, they've been likened to a kind of a cool box, uh, not full of beer, but full of batteries. And um, in here, you can see that they're a kind of a rack mounted style. So you could mount these into a typical server rack type setup as well. They do come with some feet as well that you can just mount them on the floor basically. But I think it's quite a nice setup because it hides them in a nice neat box. And in here, you just got the battery to battery cables and then you've got the communications cables and the earth cables. 
So one of the first and biggest differences with sodium batteries is the abundance of sodium, because like I said, it's basically salt, right? So salt is commonly found everywhere and it's easier to extract sodium than it is to extract lithium. There's less water used, so it's better for the environment. And overall, it's just a much more plentiful material, which should eventually mean that sodium batteries, if manufactured at large scale, should be cheaper than lithium as well. The second advantage with sodium batteries is that they're highly thermally stable. And what that means is that they can operate at a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius all the way up to 55 degrees Celsius. They are very, very safe, even safer than lithium iron phosphate batteries. One of the major benefits of these batteries is their environmental impact. As I mentioned earlier, the raw materials are much easier to get hold of, so less impact on the environment at the beginning of life of sourcing the materials, but also at the end of life when it comes to recycling these batteries, they're a lot easier to recycle as well, which makes them better for the environment. So now we're going to commission the system using the 11 Energy app. So we tap commission an inverter and it's going to look for our inverter and search in the area to see if it's found any inverters that haven't been commissioned yet. It does this via Bluetooth. Let's see if it finds it. And here we go. We've got our inverter not commissioned. We click commission. It does a little safety check for us basically to, to warn us about a fatal installer error that we've probably all been guilty of at some point, which is not connecting the CT clamps correctly. Uh, basically, the meter that is supplied with the system has RS485 communication with the inverter and then the CT is connected into the meter. That provides the grid CT and basically monitors how much power the house is using, and whether you're importing or exporting to the grid. So we've noted that. We're pretty confident that we've wired the CT up correctly. And then we're going to choose the number of battery modules. Now in here it gives us instructions about which way to set the dip switches to make sure that each battery knows which number it needs to be and also where to plug the communications cables which is really handy. Then it's going to search through all the devices so the meter, the grid connection and the CT, the batteries and the PV so let's see if it finds everything. Wow we've got four green ticks looks good let's see what the next step is. Okay, so now we've got to connect it to the Wi-Fi for the customer so that they can monitor it in the app and that it can communicate with the 11 Energy Cloud. And then we just need to put all of our site details in. So we put our service cutout fuse rating, the, the export limit that's been provided by the DNO, and then the details of the strings. So in this case, we've got string one, which is an east-facing string with 10 panels, and they are 480 watts each. The tilt angle is 43 degrees and then string two is the southwest one and we've got 10 panels on that as well and they're also 480 watts and the tilt angle is also 43 degrees click next and now it's registering our, our inverter oh connecting to cloud commissioning successful press next to continue and now we add the customer's email address and it will hand off the system to the customer and enable them to monitor the system in the 11 Energy app. The other cool thing about the 11 Energy app is it integrates with Shelly devices. So for example, the smart plugs or this EM Pro, you can clamp this around your EV charger circuit and it'll stop the batteries from discharging into your electric vehicle. Or something like this, a little smart switch that you can use to actually control your immersion heater, for example, so that if you're generating excess solar, you can push some of that solar energy into your immersion heater. And it's all seamlessly done within the 11 Energy app. You don't need to set everything up first in the Shelly app and then transfer it over. So that's a really nice little feature, I think. You can also set different work modes and smart schedules. For example, working with smart tariffs to schedule charging and discharging of the batteries. So if you want to leverage smart tariffs and make the most of your batteries, it's easy to do so within the app. So that's it, one sodium battery system complete with solar panels and all the trimmings fully complete and running. Let me know all your thoughts in the comments about this system. Are you excited about sodium battery technology? I think it's pretty cool to see where things are heading with this and it's only gonna get more and more popular. So let's see where 11 Energy heads next. And thanks to 11 Energy for sponsoring this video. If you wanna find out more about all of their stuff, there's a link below where you can find out more.